got to have the, the company sign up there and the local sign. <clears throat> the launch uh, was pretty much like uh, all launches. Uh, Keep saying that. <laughs> Well, since you started, Sally, why don't you tell what it felt like there? <laughs> well, actually, I was, um, I was pleasantly surprised because I thought that the simulator really prepared us well for it. We have a motion-based simulator. Yay. <laughs> Yay for the simulator that, uh, that simulates the, what you're supposed to feel on launch. It gives you the vibration and, and uh, a lot of the shaking that you get during first stage. And I thought it was very representative um, all the way up through uh, SRB separation. It simulated the, the tail off, the deceleration that you get at uh, the separation of the solids. And it also uh, simulated very well the really smooth ride that you get during second stage on uh, just the main engines. And I guess that we've all commented that that part of the ride is just like, just like having a big electric motor behind you. It's that smooth, really smooth. Uh, from my standpoint, uh, being my second flight on the shuttle, it seemed like it was uh, much smoother. That's probably because I wasn't nearly as excited. Maybe I was a little calm this time. <laughs> but it really is a, a super machine. Performs well. It's really nice to have an experienced tour guide there, too, because he could tell us what was going to happen. <laughs> and uh, I think everybody in the cockpit was having fun. That was having fun. This is right after we open the payload bay doors, and I believe we're passing uh, over uh, Mexico, the coastline of Mexico there, and it's just to uh, show you what it looks like as we're tailed down to the earth, passing, uh, passing over the both land and uh, sea areas. Clouds were very beautiful. There's a poor old CDR trying to get in his chair. We wanted to get shots in here of each of the crew people, uh, so you'll see us go uh, from uh, one to another as we're man maneuvering around the uh, flight deck. This just proved we all were there. <laughs> John's coming up to find out where we're at. We spent an awful lot of time looking out those, uh, those overhead windows. John, you want to talk? This is... Uh... The beginning of the sequence of the deployment of the Palapa telecommunications satellite. The sun shield is opening there in the back, and uh, the ANIC would have been in front of this, but we had deployed it earlier. And uh, after the sun shield is open, we withdraw some restraints and begin to spin uh, the telecommunications satellite, getting it ready for uh, its deployment. And there's a spin going now. It, uh, it spins at uh, 50 revolutions per minute. And Sally and uh, Crip had the best view of this, at looking out the back window. But it really is a, a nice vehicle to launch uh, from every respect to work just like a champ. And she's just about getting ready to pop here. There she goes. And as you can see, it's very clean, going right up the tail. And uh, about two feet per second differential velocity between uh, the satellite and the orbiter. And uh, Cripp was at the back window here and uh, grabbed a 16 millimeter camera. As it went out of view there, he took this picture out the overhead window. And you could watch it for a very long period of time. I don't know, Sally, how long do you think we had it in view? I don't know. It was, it was several minutes, though. We could track it. And there it is at even greater distance. Uh, 45 minutes after deployment, it fires a rocket that sends it uh, up towards its geosynchronous orbit, and we understand that Palapa and Anik are both uh, in their operational orbits at this time and doing extremely well. What you just saw there was the Ohm's ignition, which we used for the, uh, for the set burn to uh, move us a little bit away from it. And the oscillation that you saw at the end of that picture was uh, oscillation in the camera out in, the, that, uh, in response to the Ohm's burn. That's the Cephas, and uh, what I was doing there was taking out a, one of the samples and putting in the next, the next sample. Those are the little syringes that contain the, uh, the samples that then flow up that column and they're collected up at the top. And that's the, uh, the computer that goes with the Cephas. Rick said, do something that looks interesting. <laughs> I don't know, but it, every time she'd come up to the flight deck while she was supposed to be operating Cephas, and uh, she'd be up there a while, and this thing go beep, beep, and she said bye, and she'd go back down there to tend to it again. There was a, 
There's the Dr. Thager doing a little medical stuff. Norm, you want to? Well, our patient wouldn't give us permission to show him, but it was John. <laughs> <laughs> we now have a contest to see who can identify the person on the treadmill. Right. Uh, the old CDR trying to get some exercise. That uh, treadmill works works very well uh, from uh, trying to simulate z uh, 1G again, but uh, it's enough to. It's not exactly like running here on Earth, but it uh, makes you work up a sweat and use your legs a little bit, which is what the intent is. And this is a collection device looking for microorganisms or about the uh, the orbiter. It's a little little fan that pulls them in and separates them. This is just to prove that I got on the treadmill too. <laughs> Sally was working very hard, and I was up near the pantry, and uh, we found some, a bag of cashews. Uh, you had to be quick to grab the cashews because Sally was. <laughs> Food. I wasn't going to let those get away. Right. We're all asked about uh, privacy of, on board uh, with five people and uh, both sexes, and we did have a little privacy curtain over the head area, and this is Rick describing or hooking it up, so it'll give you an idea what it's like. And that, that worked very well. And you want to... yeah, we're getting ready here for uh, the... The deployment on the proximity operations day of the SPAS satellite, and this is uh, lifting the SPAS out of the orbiter. You can see uh, a few, cam few of the cameras on the top of the SPAS, uh, 16 millimeter, 70 millimeter, and a couple of uh, TVs that were used to provide some of the spectacular photography and TV that you saw. And the SPAS was an ideal satellite to work with. It was extremely stable and, uh, and worked very well throughout the entire flight. So did the arm. You can tell from this picture that it's, the arm is, uh, is doing exactly what it's being commanded to do. It's pulling the spas straight up. One of the neat activities we had to do was on day five, we did what we referred to as proximity operations, that is flying around the vicinity of the spas. This is John doing the release on it. John, you want to come? Right. This is the first uh, release, I guess, and we've uh, squeezed a trigger to release the end effector on the remote manipulator arm from the fixture on the spas. And then pulling the arm back away from it. Meanwhile, the nervous CDR was sitting there with his hands on the controls in case it started to diverge, and we, uh, <coughs> we go, went ahead and started separating from it. Actually, we were above it, or correction, below it with respect to the Earth, and that's what it looked like from the other direction. We're sitting out of, of, about 200 feet at this time, and that's from a 16-millimeter camera that was located on the spas. When we got down to 200 feet, we uh, started uh, going out f in front and uh, then coming back up to uh, exactly in front of it. We're about 1,000 feet out now, uh, uh, flying directly in front of it. The, the orbiter is a super vehicle as far as uh, flying in close uh, vicinity to another satellite on orbit. From a pilot standpoint, uh, you couldn't ask for any better performance. View from the other direction, uh, that's a spa sitting out there. It, uh, we actually took a little license. It was the shot when we were out a thousand feet. It was so small it didn't show up very well. We set out there for a couple of revs, uh, and it was very easy to, uh, to manually control that. And this shows us uh, starting back in. Very shortly, you're going to see a uh, view looking down. You'll see two lights. That's the payload bay lights, and look for the RCS jet firing. This is looking down at the orbiter. And now we'll see some from inside the cockpit. Those are the forward RCS. Sounds like you got a small war going on outside when you're doing proximity operations because you do use those large jets a considerable amount. You'll see the approach that we're making for the grapple. And uh, both vehicles were just about as stable as anybody could want them. And uh, when you're flying a big machine like the orbiter, which is 200,000 pounds, you, you do it nice and nice and slow, which is the way we made the approach. And John, you want to comment on your grapple here? And here's the grapple to retrieve the spas after that first phase of proximity operations, and uh, very manageable task done from inside the cockpit using hand controllers, and you can see very, very slight oscillations there, about probably about a quarter inch in amplitude as we close in on the grapple fixture getting ready for the capture, and there it is. 
This is starting of the uh, second uh, portion of Prox Ops. Uh, we had lunch after the first t uh, day. We put the, excuse me, after first phase, uh, Sally and, and John had put the uh, spas in a sun-shielded attitude because it had been warming up during the early portion. And uh, spas here is still on the end of the arm, and Sally's maneuvering it back out to uh, its release position. And what you're seeing is the spas TV as uh, she maneuvered it to this to the position. You also see the sun glint off the water down there. We're going to show you some still photography a little bit later where we utilize that feature. The first release that I did was a was a simulated backup release and that went went really smoothly. That was something we were a little concerned about, about the drift rates that the arm might give the spas. But the rates were, were really low, and uh, we headed right off into the, the plume survey. The purpose of the plume data take, as you know, is to fire jets at the spas and uh, use uh, post-landing uh, uh, measurements from the spas to see how much upset there was due to the jets. And we're looking down from the spas now during that phase of operations firing uh, one of the nose jets up near the black nose uh, and looking for any motion. There was very little detectable motion except during uh, uh, one of the aft maneuvers. Here we're flying up and over the spas in what is known as the inertial approach. We're reorienting the uh, orbiter's axis to align with the uh, proper uh, grapple fixture axis on the spas. We're looking through the uh, COAS there, the optical sight, and that was one of our aids in uh, making sure that we're maintaining position on it. We're at it about 200 feet, maintaining that radius as we fly around it. You can see we've passed up and over the spas and uh, almost uh, going around a little bit behind it now. We had purposely maneuvered the spas uh, out of the attitude that it had been in for the entire flight. Uh, and then the, the point of this was to maneuver the orbiter as well to line up its axes with the spas axes. And we'd like to compliment NASA on the orbiter model that they got for us to take these pictures. <laughs> we were told this morning in their management brief that the camera that took those 16 millimeter from the spas was used on Little Joe in the, early in the space program years ago. Not a white sense. This is the uh, approach and grapple for the, the end of phase two. And you can see slight oscillations in the arm, but it's really it's really doing just about exactly what I'm commanding it to do. And it, it turned out to be a very easy task and uh, just no problem at all. Uh, this is a, actually a still shot that was taken uh, during entry by John, and he did a super job of capturing what it looks like outside the windows. That's just about the perfect color of the globe. Uh, we spent most of the time in the, in the darkness during entry. Uh, the vehicle uh, had no surprises. It flew uh, just like we anticipated it would. Uh, our cross range for the entry we flew was a little over 730 miles, nautical miles, which is the max that uh, a shuttle has done thus far. Uh, we did end up we did end up doing some entry maneuvers because of that uh, cross range, been, but the red, we picked up the most important ones. This is showing us coming in over the heading alignment circle. I took manual control. Uh, just about the time we were overhead Edwards uh, flying uh, manually. This is a camera that was mounted over my left shoulder because they said they wanted some shots of what it looks like in the cockpit. Shows you what it looks like out of, out of Rick's window. The vehicle is super from a pilot standpoint. We had a heads up display mounted in both uh, Rick's and my windows that we were utilizing and it uh, allowed us to control our management uh, energy just like we wanted it to. That uh, shows the aim point that we're using for the landing uh, which is just this side of the lake bed. It's a rectangle not the triangle you're seeing. And uh, going into the pre-flare maneuver we had a bar of light, so sitting down to the left of the runway, we also use as a visual aid. Rick put down the gear at uh, 200 feet, which is where we'd planned. And uh, like most of the way I like to fly when I'm over a lake bed is I like to get down low fairly fast and uh, then just kind of hold it there until it gets ready to get down with the proper airspeed. 
uh, it was just like uh, flying our shuttle training aircraft. As far as I was concerned, it, uh, it handled very nice. We waited till we, we touched down about 205 knots and we uh, weighed 180 and we derotated to get the nose down the uh, deck and we basically used uh, light braking, uh, hardly any braking at all. The touchdown was so light that John and I wanted to call the convoy to find out whether we had touched. Right. I had a pair to say that. <laughs> I got some coming too. Then. <laughs> okay. Even though we were using light braking, uh, the total uh, runway utilized was, I believe, uh, something around 1,300. 13,000 feet, uh, which would admit if we'd been landed on a 15,000 foot runway, I would have still had no problem getting stopped. It is still a super machine. And it really is. Even managed to get back to the center line of the runway after I had to roll all that way. You can tell by the shadow behind the orbiter how early it was in the morning at uh, Edwards. Of course, a lot of you know that because getting up so early. <laughs> 